Welcome everyone to our Hystericology podcast. We are here with a guest that we're very excited to be interviewing today. If you'll introduce yourself. I'm Katie Reed. I am excited to be here. I just discovered that I'm the first interviewee on this podcast, which is quite the honor. So I'm excited about that. I am a therapist for many, many years. And uh, I'm also the founder of the Clinic Coach Academy. So we are the only certification for therapists who want to become coaches, who want to outgrow the traditional office and use their skills in things like coaching, consulting, online courses, all that good stuff. So we help therapists do that. Really exciting. And I've been following you, Katie, for a couple of years now, and I've just been really impressed with your process. I think I originally saw you when I was looking into coaching myself, but also potentially hiring coaches for my business and and a couple of different things. And what I what I saw with what you were doing interests me because it was really similar to what I was looking to do myself. Uh-huh. And we've we've gone down different paths, but your path I think is is really unique and really fascinating and it's something that a lot of therapists have considered. But then also right. a lot of therapists um, maybe even look down on in some way. Yeah. Like yeah. Kind of given up. Right. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, some of that I do feel like just comes from a lack of understanding. Like I think, a lot, so here's, I can go on about this for days, but <laughs> here's what I think happens. Um, therapists, you've probably heard me say, if you've followed me, we are the lowest paid of the highly educated professions. There is a lot of guilt in the therapy world about charging for our services. We tend to be people who come in with the heart of a helper and we genuinely just truly wanna help other people. And we feel our own guilt, we have our own money issues, our own imposter syndrome issues, all of those things because we're human, they're part of it. We bring all of those things to the table. And on top of that, a lot of us know it's a hard job and it's a hard job where you know, a surgeon is a hard job, but they're probably going home in their fancy car to their nice house at the end of the day. And that's not necessarily the case for the rest of us average therapists out here. You know, it's a hard job and it can be a hard living and a hard life. And it can be very frustrating to see other people who don't have that same incredible level of education and who haven't had to prove their worthiness over and over through years of interning and licensing exams and on and on and on, all the things we have to do. And they are pulling ahead what seems like more quickly and more easily than the average therapist. And I do think that can create possibly some resentment, but also I think often just confusion, not really understanding what is this whole new coaching world? What is it? It's so in its infancy that a lot of us don't even really know yet what it means. I don't even think the coaching world knows exactly what it is yet. You know, they're still trying to figure it out too. And so because of that, because it's not clearly defined, it creates confusion. And for us as licensed people, we don't tolerate confusion very well. We have very strict law and ethics that we need to follow and so having that confusion come up is scary and it it makes it hard for us to figure out those boundaries now the reality is if you just peel away like one layer of that surface all the confusion falls away it becomes very clear what the differences are and how a therapist can effectively use their same skills but move into coaching or build an online course or run a retreat or any of those things but before before they dig into that, it's easy to just get confused or frustrated or imagine that all coaches are bad and they're just want to be therapists. And it's just not the case. And I will say to you guys, because I'm sure you know too, I always look and I'm like, listen, there are good therapists and bad therapists. Yes. Just like oh, yeah. there's gonna be good coaches and bad like it's this is there's good accountants and bad accountants, you know. <laughs> this is just the reality. And so we can't throw out every coach in the world and say, oh, they're all just bad and they're all just want to be therapists. It's simply not the case. So a question I have for you is I'd heard you say that in, I think it's the Bad Bitch Therapist podcast that you were Uh on talking about um, this idea that uh, coaching is in his infancy. You've just said that here too. So my question for you and what you're doing is how do you hope to shape the coaching world and profession as it moves into its adolescence, as it moves into its adulthood? What's your vision for for the next five or 10 years? And how do you want to help shape that? 
That's such a great question. And I love how you phrased it. I, so to me, when I look at the coaching world and the entire sort of online education space in general, which is a multi, multi, multi billion dollars, I mean, it's huge space. I look at it. And for me, my brain just screams, therapists should be the ones doing this. You know, we should be the ones at the forefront. We should be the ones shaping and defining what the entire coaching world looks like because we're coming in with so much education, because we're coming in with a strong ethical platform beneath us, because we have all of that, we should be the ones out there defining this space. So part of what I did when I was developing the clinic coach certification, I was like, for one thing, we need a name that sets us apart in the eyes of the lay person that they can look and go, oh, that's actually a clinically trained coach. That is a different level of coach. And my goal as we slowly, I mean, we're still a young program, we're only a couple of years old, but as we slowly grow is that that clinic coach name becomes more of a household name where people are like, if you need a coach, you have to go to that directory. You have to go to cliniccoaches.com because those people are clinically trained coaches. And then that becomes like the first stop shop as people are looking for a coach in their lives so that we raise the bar on the level of coaching in the world in general so that people come to expect if I go to a coach, they're actually going to be trained enough to know if maybe I need therapy instead. Maybe I actually do have a clinical level of need and this person needs to refer me to a therapist. That's what I hope, hope, hope happens out in that world is that eventually people are truly seeking like who here is a therapist first i want that person as my coach or i want that person uh teaching an online class that i just bought and downloaded or leading a retreat that i want to go to to me that protects the public it advances everybody really because now we're taking people with this huge level of knowledge we're making it more accessible we're saying now we can serve people outside of the area right around our local office now our knowledge can have an impact on so many more people in the ways that we can spread online and grow all of those things like they benefit everyone and they benefit us as therapists because we finally get to decide exactly how we want to live our lives we are finally granted a level of freedom and hopefully of income that allows us to live lives where we're not limping into the office burned out like hell and trying to tell our clients how to be happy, <laughs> you know, which is the reality that we go through. I just recorded another podcast earlier today, and we were talking about that, that the reality is there are times in your life, especially, and hopefully they're transient, but where you might be incredibly depressed, or you might be going through grief, or you might be going through a terrible thing, and you are not at your best to be able to lead your clients because you're human too. And so being able to give therapists the freedom and more flexibility again in their lives to really have their lives that they can define how they want their lives to be and that they can be living at their absolute optimal, that is what then helps the clients pull up to their absolute optimal. Then we're all kind of pulling each other up that chain. Oh, yeah. And I love that. And you talk a lot about that freedom based lifestyle. And in my mind, that's, that's more than just time freedom. And you're describing that a bit here. It's freedom to be able to practice in the way that we see fit that we want to practice that's not as limited. And as therapists, there is so much fear through graduate school instilled by supervisors instilled by ethical boards and ethical conferences it's like you know, if i step one toe out of line i'm yes. going to get sued and i'm going to lose my license yes that, that fear really restricts being able to even think about a freedom based lifestyle and then on top of that there's the sense of of guilt and elizabeth and i have talked about this on a previous co- podcast where you feel like, or you're told even, that you're not in it for the right reasons. You're not doing therapy for the right reasons if you also want to have a whole life, if you also want to make money, if you want to drive a nice car, if you want a nice house. Mm -hmm. How do you see that with yourself and with the people that you work with? How do you see that pushing up against this idea of a freedom-based lifestyle? So, okay, let's talk about, so when I talk about freedom-based lifestyle, I have tended over time, I divide it into three categories in my mind because I was like, how do we define that? What does that actually mean, right? Like everybody talks about that. What does that actually mean? 
So for me, it means three different things. Like you just mentioned, time freedom. Now, what is time freedom? We all have very different capacities as human beings. Some people, five hours of intense client work might be a full-time job, and that is what they can do. But that means that for those five hours, they are so good. They are so on it. They are amazing. You know, they're incredible. But that's all they can give. And some people, they might need to work in the middle of the night because that's their body clock. Or they might need to work at five in the morning because that's their body clock. So time freedom to me is setting up a life that works within your schedule. And you probably know a bit of my story. My kids were diagnosed with special needs. And my life turned upside down because I suddenly had to be available to take them to all different services all day long. And I still needed to make money but I needed it to fit into my bizarre schedule that changed every week. I could no longer just go to a therapy office and turn off my phone and kind of hope, you know, nobody called. And I couldn't do that. I had to be there for my kids. And so time freedom for me meant my schedule is going to be weird and different every week. And I need to be able to make that work because I put my family first. And that comes to the second type of freedom, which is values freedom. So values freedom to me is what do you value and put first in your life, in your identity? So I just named for me, my family is always going to come first in everything I do. That's my top value. We have other people, though, where maybe they're very spiritual or very woo or religious or there's some part of their identity that they don't feel like they can really bring into the therapy room. You know, that that feels kind of restricted just by virtue of the role that they're playing. And when they start to step into coaching or they start to build an online program, they're suddenly like, oh, I'm kind of coming out of a closet here. Like I can actually show my whole self. I can actually be my full person and live and talk about these things that I value and that are important to me. That is also part of values freedom. And then the final piece, of course, is financial freedom. And it's always funny to me because therapists, like, we don't get a lot, but we'll get like the occasional angry email that's like, financial freedom. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? I have yet to meet a therapist where financial freedom means they want like 10 Lamborghinis and, you know, yeah. a mansion in Palm Springs or something like I, all we want, really, everyone I know, is just enough that you're not panicking about the bills every month, that you're putting away for your kid's college, <laughs> you know, maybe you're going on vacation somewhere nice once a year. Like, it's really basic. It's basic security, decent life, not being in a panic about money all the time, which is what most of us seek. And so those different types of freedoms all together to me, if you can achieve those three things together in one job, you've really made it. That is that freedom-based life. And especially if you can do it using the skills that you have and using the things that you love, that is that freedom-based life. And so to anyone who is in that still maybe more constricted place about it where they're feeling, because let me tell you, I have such empathy for the people who are exactly what you were just saying, who's like, that's terrible and you're in it for the wrong reasons, because I was that person. I worked inner city social work four years, picking up my clients in my broken down car, bringing them around to their appointments, you know, finding my homeless clients on the street, bringing them to the free clinics. Like I was that person eating ramen noodles when I got home because I couldn't afford anything else. I'm dead broke at this job. And I would lecture people about how, well, everyone should have to work like this because these clients need us and everybody needs us. And it doesn't matter that I'm broke. And, you know, I was very much in that place too. And so I fully empathize with it. And I get that mindset a hundred percent. And being in a different place now in my life than I was 20 years ago doing that, I can also look back and say, I was not the best person I could have been for those clients because I wasn't living my life at its best level at all. I was under constant stress. I was under constant worry about finances. I was, you know, going through a lot of the same struggles they were going through in some ways, just at different levels, right? And so because of that, because I can look at it now and say, oh, wow, I really get it now that, you know, you invited me onto this podcast, which was so kind of you. You would not have done that to the therapist that I was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I did not have a message 20 years ago because I had not lived into the space of growing my own life to a point where I can stand on this side of the line, the imaginary line and say, it is so much 
better over here. You guys, come on. It's so much better over here. And actually, I know people always say to me, you have a lot of energy. It's because I'm excited about like, to me, if we can pull all the therapists into a place where they're willing to engage their own creativity and find their own spark and learn what it's like to bring your skills out to bigger and bigger groups of people. If we can pull all the therapists up to doing that, think how many more millions of people they can help and they can impact because all of us have these unique life stories and unique experiences that we can bring out and that we can bring forward to people. And I just love, love, love thinking about the ripple effects of that over time. I get so excited about it. And one thing that has really excited me about even what you're saying here, what I've been hearing you say in other podcasts I've listened to, even looking at your website, is it answers some of what we have not only talked about, started to talk about in our own just podcast talking to each other, but so many times outside of that, how there doesn't seem to be meaningful answers to, like you said, therapists working really hard, but not always being compensated on a level that even feels livable. That burnout that happens because you're abridging yourself and making yourself so tiny. And in some cases, in toxic workplace cultures that really take yes. advantage of wanting you to feel like it's shameful to want to be paid appropriately. But I love that you're so interested true. in expanding out and helping people kind of fulfill the measure of their potential versus what so many of us, so many of us feel we're doing, which is kind of trying to make ourselves small where we are. And so I'm really interested in, was for you there like a moment that sparked that inspiration where it dawned on you or you had a realization and you're like, I am done with this life of driving my clients around in my broken down car. Did you have a moment like that? Or was it like a slow burn realization over time? I am a late bloomer in all things. And I feel like it was a slow burn for me. So I will tell you truly what started out for me, we moved with my husband's job. And so as is another crappy thing <laughs> about the therapy world. I crossed one state line and my like, I don't know what it was at that point, like 18 years licensed and community mental health director and supervisor for 40 interests. They didn't care. As soon as I got to my new state, you were like ground zero, take new licensing exams, start over from the bottom again. And so I needed to make money. Like I needed to help support the family. And really I started, this whole thing was just started with me going, I need to at least be able to bring in grocery money for my family. You know, I need to figure this out somehow. And so I started offering a little bit of marketing and copywriting consultation for fellow therapists. And then that grew a little bit. And then I was like, I have an old broken down car. I need to try to replace my car before it kills us all, <laughs> you know? And so then it was like, okay, we saved up the down payment for the car. Like little by little things grew. And so for me, there was that slow burn, but I do think it's interesting what happened I don't even know how long ago, maybe within even the last year, I was having that moment where I was like, I really enjoy what I do. And I enjoy teaching this marketing. Like I, we teach a ton of marketing to all of our therapists. We teach them how to take their skills and repackage it in different ways. So I love teaching all of that stuff. And I know it's a big learning curve and I genuinely enjoy it. But I was also like, am I really like on earth to teach marketing to therapists? Like, does that, is that really like the whole thing. And I was having that where I was journaling about it day after day after day, like, what is my bigger purpose here? And in that process, what started to come up for me as things do when you're in that process where you're kind of looking for them and noticing more and more, I realized that we had people, our clients in the six figure flagship, the, the one program I run is called six figure flagship. It's the only way to work with me. Um, but I had clients in that program, and they were coming in and they were like, Oh, my God, uh, my parent is ill and dying. And because I'm doing coaching, I was able to move back home and support them and be with them through that process. Oh my God, my child is going through this huge thing. And because of doing coaching, I don't have to be in the office all day and I'm able to support them through this process. Oh my God, uh, one client just is buying a boat because she and her husband are going to live on the boat and travel the world because that's been their lifelong dream. And it was suddenly hitting me. I was like, I'm not, I get kind of emotional about it. I'm not just teaching marketing. I'm helping people step into their biggest lives. And that's amazing to me. And especially when we think about if you can help therapists step into their biggest lives, then all of the good that they can do for the rest of the world is incredible to me. 
And so I love that. And I feel like that has been a large part of my learning and my growth. Like I'm a completely different person just in terms of my own self-concept and my self-image and like what I can bring out into the world. I'm a completely different person than I was in 2018 when I was starting this business and trying to figure it all out. And so being able to see that, we just had a client just this morning who um, came into the group and she's like, I literally just got a call from a television production company and they want to do an entire TV show about my niche. And I'm going to maybe be the expert on this show in my coaching niche, which is incredible. It's like when you think about the possibilities for people's lives that they never, if they just stayed in their private practice therapy, this would have never come their way. But because they got brave and they got creative and they stepped out and they took those risks, these incredible things are coming their way. And that's so amazing to me. It is. That's really incredible. And so it's, what is the line in your mind? It's easy to say the the difference between coaching and therapy. Usually what I hear from coaches about the difference is that uh, coaching is about your future and helping you gain things in your future and therapy yeah. keeps you stuck in the past. <laughs> I hate that line. I, that line cracks me up because I feel like that line to me was made up by a coach who was trying to like make therapy sound bad. And um, to me, that's not it as all because you and I, we all know as therapists, you're talking about the past and the future. Mm-hmm. As a coach, you're talking about the past and the future. So for me, and um, the ethical standard that we set in our program for the clinic coaches who get certified is really, it. the dividing line is a clinical versus a non-clinical level of need. So if you wanna talk about anxiety, there's generalized anxiety disorder and there's panic attacks and there's a lot of stuff that is gonna need a therapist and, If you want to talk about anxiety in the coaching realm, there's people who get jitters on a first date. You know, there's a lot of ways. There's people who get nerves if they have to get up and speak at work or they want a raise at work, but they're too afraid to ask for it because that anxiety comes up. There's a lot of ways that we can take what we already know, but just choose a situation or a level of need that is that non-clinical level of need. So that's where people often repackage. Now, the other thing that happens for a lot of people, therapists, is their coaching niche might not actually be their clinical niche. It might be something that they've just lived through because often this is where our passions come, right? So we've had coaches who uh, they went through a terrible divorce and they wanted to help other women not have to go through a terrible divorce and they wanted to help with that or they've had to go back to like dating post-divorce or single moms and what it's like to be dating as a single mom or any sort of life experience, you're still bringing all your psychological information, everything that you know to the forefront in your therapy or in your coaching. But now as a coach, you actually have more freedom to talk about your lived experience, to bring your story, your personal story, into that space and into that room. And and people, it's like that twinship, right? Like people love that. They're like, oh, you understand me because you've lived through something similar and that can help so much. And for the therapist too, I think that's a, a level of freedom that I would think of as well, being able to say like, hey, I'm here and I'm a person and I have a story. I'm not yes. like slate all the time. Right, right. Well, and I think uh, my question for you in that is, How does your program help people who, or I'll frame it this way, for people who maybe are self-proclaiming, hey, I'm a coach, I'm a coach, I can help you. What's the benefit of engaging in a program like yours? And are there entry-level certifications for people who aren't clinical right now? Is it purely for people who have that clinical degree and then want to expand? Because I know part of where and again, where when we previously recorded, we were really hard on those self-proclaimed coaches because there's such big promises. As you even mentioned earlier, we have to be concerned about protecting potential clients. And yeah, yeah, yeah. when that training doesn't exist for people, they don't they don't even know they're potentially putting their clients in harm. Are there entry level uh, certification options for people who don't have the clinical background? And uh, how does your program really help people go from maybe being self-proclaimed, making promises that maybe they can or can't deliver to really being in a much better position to really help the people that they're hoping to coach? It's an interesting question. So our program is only for therapists. Okay. 
So we don't, so our clinic coach certification, it's just for therapists. So we're all in there together. We're all having the same uh, questions, challenges, struggles as therapists growing into coaching. So that is really our specialty area. So we're taking in the people who are already at that level of experience and expertise. In terms of other people out there in the world, you're absolutely right. You know, coaching is unregulated. It would not surprise me at all if some point in the future, they decide, hey, if you want to call yourself a coach, you need to be a therapist first. That would not surprise me at all. Much the same way that we've seen other things come up. Like when I think about uh, behavioral analysis as a newer development over the past several years. And for a while, it was like, Anybody who had any sort of master's in any realm of psychology could go sit for a test and become a behavior analyst. Then it got tighter. And then it was like, oh, no, no, you actually need your master's in behavior analysis first. And so I'm like, I could see where the coaching world over time might get tighter and tighter and where an education like ours could become the thing that they do need to have first. It wouldn't surprise me one bit. Um, and people always ask, I'm like, I have no control over this. <laughs> mm -hmm. People are always like, well, so are you helping with that? I'm like, I there's not like a guy that you go talk to who's the boss of coaching. It doesn't work. That way. <laughs> so, but I could absolutely see where that could be, where things develop in the future or that people need to just have more psychological education. The reality of most coaching programs, um, if you look at like ICF and the various uh certification bodies that are out there. The reality of most of them, because we looked very deeply into them as we were building ours, and they basically mimic your first semester of grad school. So most decent, good coaching programs are going to teach basic coaching ethics, similar to therapy, you know, don't sleep with your clients, have confidentiality, like the basics. They're going to teach that. They're going to teach the frame. They're going to teach active listening. Uh, they're going to teach um, probably some form of CBT. Now, every coaching program will tend to have their slightly different flavor of CBT, but they usually tend to be teaching some form of CBT as the primary intervention. So I look at all of that and I'm like, right, we all learned that first semester. <laughs> you know, we went a lot deeper after that. But it makes complete sense that those are really the basics that someone needs to have in place just to start the most basic foundational coaching program. Now that said, someone can be an absolutely amazing coach having not been a therapist first. There are people that are just born natural helpers and they can go get that basic certification somewhere and set up and have their basic frame and understand basic ethics and be fantastic and help tons of people. Uh, you know, most of us who are therapists if there had never been a law that said you need to go get this degree and do all this stuff, we would probably still be natural therapists for our friends and family, just because it's part of our makeup and it's part of our character. And so we truly believe there are naturally gifted coaches out there, just like there are gifted therapists. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, if co coaching does try to regulate itself a bit, and that that's one of the things that they look for is an education more like ours. Another question for you, where do you think people can often go wrong when they're trying to enter the coaching field, whether they are at a clinical level, a therapist, and they're deciding if they want to expand in that way, or somebody, like you said, who might have natural talents or desires to help, and they're yep. trying to enter that way. Where do people have to make the biggest missteps? Uh, okay, that's a great question. Opinion. Yeah, I love that. You know what, I will speak mainly to therapists, because all my clients are therapists. So this is where I see those missteps happen. So number one, and I see this more with people who don't come to us because we're really strict about it. Um, people, therapists don't separate out their two businesses. They just stick a coaching page on their website. This is unsafe uh, for the client because it's expecting the client to have a level of understanding and discernment about the differences between therapy and coaching that we cannot expect the client to have. It's our job to explain those differences. It's also ethically, it's the best case scenario is you completely separate out your two businesses. It's very clear what the distinction is. Um, we have, for our clients, for the clinic coaches, they actually go through, we have um, special legal documents for them that were developed just for therapists becoming coaches, but we actually have them tell their coaching clients and explain, I am a therapist. I am not your therapist. I am your coach, but I am following the ethics of my license. So let me explain mandated reporting and let me explain limits to confidentiality because you're going to be held to that ethical standard no matter what. 
And so therapists who maybe they don't come through our program, they don't have anybody like watching that for them. If they're skirting that, I believe you put your license at risk. And I believe you put potential clients at risk because you're expecting them to do the heavy lifting of understanding the differences and it's not their job. So that's number one. The second thing that is the most challenging for most therapists coming into our program is that we are not very good at clearly defining a problem and how we're going to help with it. And this is because we have been expected to help everyone with everything forever. And even if I know there's people out there listening and going like, but I've got a niche, I've got a niche. Yeah, you do. And you and I both know full well that somebody comes in and they're a perfect fit for your niche. But six months later, you're talking about every single thing in their entire life, whether you're an expert in that or not. And they're expecting you to have the answers and the solutions for every single thing in their entire life. And we have all had those like deer in headlights moments where you're like, I have never dealt with this clinical issue before. Like here we are, you know? And so with coaching, we actually it's very freeing once you get there, once you pick a problem that you're excited, that you're passionate about helping people with, and you just dive straight forward into that. That's very freeing and that's a great thing with coaching, but that initial changing up the language and how you think about it to actually be sort of a problem first language of if you are struggling with X, Y, Z, this is how I can help you. And making that more and more clear, it is a hard, it was, it's hard for me. It's hard for the clients. Like it's hard. It's hard because we just don't think that way naturally. And we tend to, a lot of therapists will come in uh, doing what I call is the vitamin approach versus the medicine approach. So if you leave home on vacation and you have a medicine that you have to take every day and you forget it, you're going to be in a panic until you get that medicine because you know you need this medicine. Whereas if you leave your vitamins at home, you're like, eh, a week without vitamins, I probably won't die, right? And so a lot of therapists come in, the vitamins are nice. We'd all like to take our vitamins every day. It sounds great, but it's not life or death to us. So the vitamin niches, the way I define those is like, I'm going to help people find balance or I'm going to help people live authentically. These are beautiful in the therapy room. They work really well in the therapy room. They're too undefined to work well in the coaching space. Because really no one's walking around in their life being like, the main problem in my life is that I just haven't found balance and authenticity. They're walking around going, the main problem is that my boss is a freaking jerk and my husband doesn't listen to me. And you know, like people are thinking in terms of their day-to-day lives. And so we have to train ourselves to bring our language and our the way we talk down to that problem language that the client is hearing in their own head. I like that analogy a lot. <laughs> Great analogy. Uh, I'm I'm curious. So partially your circumstances shoved you into coaching. Yeah. And then into consulting, which is what you do now, right? More right. consulting other therapists on, on becoming right. coaches. I'm curious though, even with that shove, did you come up against um any feelings of, you know, I really shouldn't do this, or or maybe I'm betraying myself and all of the years that I put into becoming a therapist if I do this, or betraying the field and Sometimes there's even like a sense of martyrdom of I need to stay in the field and fight the good fight and make it better for everyone instead of abandoning it. Or you know, what were those barriers that came up for you and how did you navigate them? Yeah, it's interesting to think, think back through that. I think in some ways I had done my murder years <laughs> for many years. I had been, like I said, I was inner city social work on the streets. And then I became eventually program director, inner city, Oakland, California, later Sacramento, California. Um, very, very, very challenging community mental health based programs. So I had done a lot of those martyrdom years. I had also at the same time been like teaching grad school and seeing private practice clients at night to make ends meet because that's how we were in an expensive state and that was just how it was. Um, And so I think I had done a lot of that. I do remember one colleague who I had worked with at one point and he had sort of moved beyond the financial martyrdom piece of therapy and I had not. And I remember, gosh, I remember so clearly He was supervising interns and I was renting office space. And so I would like run into these interns. We'd be, you know, trading in and out. And I would just chit chat with them in between session and whatnot. And I remember at the time I had been licensed many, many years. I still had total guilt about charging for my services. 
uh, this was me. If a client came in and said, well, what's your fee? I would go, well, it's $90, but I can slide. I can slide. What do you want to pay? What I, I can, whatever you need. What, uh, how low, what do you need? What do you need? Like that was me, right? Like I wouldn't even get the number out of my mouth before I'd be offering to cut the fee in half or as low as they needed. And there was one day I was chatting with this really sweet intern and she said, well, our supervisor won't let us go below 125 an hour. And I was like, I have been licensed for like a decade. I'm teaching your course at grad school tonight. And I'm here sliding down because of all my money issues, which is not to say that like all of my money issues were cured in that instant. They certainly weren't. It just made me so aware of like, wow, the way I'm relating to money and to charging fees and to charging my worth is not working for me at all. And I need to do something about it. And I think that set me on a path where little by little over time, slowly but surely, I was able to uh, change how I related to money. And the funny thing is that now, it's so wildly different now. I just talked about this. Where were we? Maybe it was just in our client meeting the other week. Um, now, I have gone from being the person who would always look for the cheapest of everything. And, you know, can I find it on the clearance rack? Can I find it at Goodwill? Like, what is the cheapest? Or if there's this great, amazing uh, course that I want to take, what's the free version? How much can I get from like the free stuff on YouTube so I don't have to pay for it? Like, it's always that, right? I was always like, what's, and that was part of my upbringing. I was raised like so frugal, Midwest, like that was just part of my upbringing. And now I'm at such a different place in my relationship to money that I have really observed that I'm looking for the best. I'm like, uh, what is the best? What is the best version of this thing? Can I afford the best version of this service or this program or this course or this experience? And what I have realized in making that change is that when you are the cheapest, the people who are looking for the best will never benefit from you. They will never be motivated by your cheap price. I am no longer low price driven in what I seek in my life. I am driven by what is the best, what is going to make me learn the fastest, what is going to give me the best user experience. And because of that, if I come to your website and you have a program that's $1,000 and someone else has a program that's $5,000, I am going to look at the $5,000 program because I'm going to expect that that is better than your program. And so while you are feeling guilty for charging $1,000, people like me who would be your ideal client, because I just do the work and I leave you alone, people like me signing up because we're like, oh, that must not be very good because they're charging this low price. And it makes me realize that even all those years as a therapist, when I was so worried about how can I be cheap and make it affordable for everybody and slide down as low as I can and all these things, that really there were other people who could have benefited from my services as a therapist, but they weren't gonna look twice at me because they wanted a therapist who was charging $200 an hour because that indicated to them that this person must be the best. Price, whether we like it or not, price is an indicator to all of us, it's a signal about the quality of whatever you're buying, a piece of clothing, a car, a service with a therapist, a coach, any of it. And so That's making that, that exact same thing. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, please, please. What's your, yeah. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, and I used to be the exact same way with my practice where I had shifted from being in a practice that mostly was covered by insurance. And so I had some clients who I was, I was seeing for even like $20, $30 per session, and, and which was crazy because I was a single mom, right, covering all of my own expenses and everything. And yet I had this feeling of like, this is what I need to do. So I did that for a while. And of course, still working full time, just like you were doing. So yeah. full time and then the private practice and trying to make it work for everybody. And then I ended up hiring a coach who had been a therapist and then shifted into coaching Cool. and raised my prices. And immediately, I, I unfortunately did lose a couple of clients, which was hard to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But immediately when I charged the higher price, which is high for Utah, uh, uh -huh. therapy in Utah above average. And then I also started implementing, if they cancel within 24 hours, I do charge them the full amount of the full right. session. And I stopped having no-shows and I stopped having clients show up 20, 30 minutes late. 
And I stopped yep. um, having clients ask me about things and then ask their aunt and their cousins and their girlfriends and all of that stuff and come back the next week in the exact same spot. Suddenly, huh. I was positioned differently where the clients yep. who continued to see me, just like you were saying, they saw me valuing myself and what I was giving to them. And immediately then they were choosing whether or not they were going to value themselves and the process and choosing yep. into that every single time is yep. a different baseline than charging Completely. a small amount of money. Completely. And <clears throat> the amazing thing is, because I know that as some people hear this, they're still having that internal thought that's like, well, then what about all the people who can only afford $10 or $20? And the reality is when you are charging enough that you can cover your living expenses and you can have your wiggle room and you're not in a panic all the time, you can keep those sliding fee sessions or you can do what a lot of people do, which is you can offer free materials to those clients. You can put out free material on the internet. You can write a book. You can write an ebook. There's a million other ways. You can get a YouTube channel where you're putting out psychoeducation every day on your YouTube channel. There's a million ways to support people that aren't necessarily just your butt in the chair with them, but that actually will give them even more support over time. I love that. And yeah, you're reminding me at, after I'd had that conversation with that intern, then a couple months later, I was getting better about like stating my fee and staying with it. And I remember one client came to me and he was like, what's your fee? And he was really in crisis. And he was like, I really need twice a week. And I was like, okay, okay. But like, this would be the fee and it'd be double that for twice a week. And he was like, that's fine. He opened his wallet and he paid me for a month in cash. He was like, that's fine. Just take it. Like, and, and he was a great client. He was like, never late. Always, you know, like he knew he was like, I need this. I'm here. And, and, and so when you get those people, it is, it's a different ball game for you because you're so much more effective as a therapist when the clients are so much more invested. Well, and I, I loved it. Obviously you're saying it here and I, in a previous podcast too, you were talking about that the opportunity we have to show up for people who are in dire need increases when our baseline and our norm isn't just accepting whatever, when we know our value, when we're willing to invest in ourselves, it's not a zero sum game of, well, now I'm in this realm and I'm not able to help. I think you had mentioned, I think it was you who were saying like your ability to donate was just yeah. incredible financially uh-huh. causes that really matter to you. And so obviously those are, it sounds like some of the potential benefits if people try to expand their professions and, and try some of these things that might be out of the box for them. But my question for you, what do you feel like is the biggest opportunity cost for people that stay in kind of that, I need to learn how to love the suffering and this is just how it is. What's the opportunity cost for staying there versus as you talked about before, stepping into this, no, I want what's bigger. I want what's better. I want that for me. And I want to be able to offer that. What's the opportunity cost for staying stuck versus expanding? I think, I think the answer is intuitive and sad in a way. I think the opportunity cost for staying stuck is that you never find out who you really are and what you're capable of. And if you're not out there, actively looking for who am I? Why am I here? How am I meant to impact other people? What? Am, why have I had my own unique struggles? What have they been aiming me towards? What have they been preparing me for? If you're not out there trying to connect the dots of your own experience in a way that you become as fully actualized as we can as human beings, and that we are truly gearing that up to help other people, then that whole cost becomes maybe a life where you're not as happy as you could be. You're not the parent or the spouse or the friend or the lover that you could be because there's some part of you that's always kind of kicking the dirt internally, mentally going, well, it's not fair. And other people have it easier than me. And why does everybody else seem to have a better life? And, and really All those things, this is why all the, you know, self-help gurus and all the speakers out there are always talking about, it's just a choice. You, one day you've just got to make the choice and get up and do the things to see what it's like to see who you are in the process of pursuing who you could become. And it really does just become that choice day after day after sometimes difficult freaking day, (laughs) you know, but that it becomes that choice. And so 
that to me is the thing that is sort of the secret behind it all. Like I thought I was starting a business to earn grocery money. I really did. And here I am a couple of years later going, oh, we're all going to self-actualize now. Like, what is that? That's crazy. That is a very unanticipated <laughs> result of all of this. But it is the reality and it is what we get to see and to watch happen and to watch the clients start to bloom as they do reconnect with their creativity and as they do reconnect with their potential. And I think too, and I'll say this, like part of it is also we are at a time in humanity right now that like we weren't in 20 years ago. I mean, gosh, when I was in grad school, there wasn't really a such thing as coaching. There certainly wasn't the internet like it exists today where it can just be this absolute machine connecting the exact right people to you. None of that really existed. So we're at a time of unique opportunities. And as much as uh, I think you can get to kind of your middle age and be like, oh, I'll just lie low until retirement. And that's not probably going to give you the life that you could have if you went forward and said, what is every possible experience? What can I take a risk on today? What feels a little bit scary today? What can I go towards? Because I'm going to learn something about myself on the other side. I, I really appreciate your message. I know for me, it's given me a different insight into possibilities that exist for implementing coaching, even into my own profession helps yeah. me uh, feel like there's hope for the coaching profession being something that we can feel a little more confidence in when people yes. are seeking out coaches and that there are opportunities being developed for I think clinicians to transition. Um, and I know I, I appreciate just seeing you embody the happiness that you're talking about, yeah. feeling fulfilled in your purpose. And that's something I know so, sometimes I feel like is missing in sometimes even feeling it within ourselves or talking with other therapists, there can be, there's a reason why we burn out. There's a reason why the yeah. burnouts are so high. And so yeah. it really gives me hope. And I love hearing a message of, hey, invest in yourself, expand yourself, yeah. recognize where these the, there's these opportunities instead of, hey, this is what you get, accept it. This is your lot in life. So deal with it. As much as there's so much opportunity and an incredible life and happiness on the other end of it, it actually is really quite difficult to get there from the mindset perspective. And part of that difficulty is other therapists, as well as other people. But really what what's gotten to me a lot over the years is the backlash from other therapists and the other therapists mm -hmm. shaming when you when you post things on social media or when you tell people even if you tell people, oh, I don't work with insurance, let alone, oh, I have high rates, or yeah, I, I also do coaching, and and that's different than therapy, there is a level of, you know, the martyrdom, there's the fear, there's the shame, there's all of that that, come, that, that other therapists are experiencing, and they push that out onto you, and mm -hmm. that can be very difficult to handle. So how do, how do you cope with being pushed back by other therapists who want to shame you back into your therapist chair. Yes, <laughs> that's a funny way to say it. I like that. Um, it was harder in the beginning because we're human and uh, it's gotten easier over time. I also, I think in the beginning, you can, let's put it this way. You'll hear this all the time. The minute you get your first hater, you know you've arrived. Everyone ignores you until they feel like you're actually somehow important enough for them to leave a trolling comment somewhere on something you posted. So when it comes to specifically things like therapist groups, I just literally left the more toxic therapist groups or unfollowed them. The ones where I saw just a lot of toxicity happening. There's nothing for you there. Just leave them. <laughs> you know, there's no reason to stay in places if you're not feeling good and you're feeling toxic. Um, we run ads. We're a business. We're a legitimate business. So we run ads. And the only place now that I'll tend to get random troll comments is on ads. Often they're so laughable and it's a person who's not a therapist anyway. Um, occasionally it is. And I will try to dialogue with the person first. And then if they're just being completely like rude or unreasonable, I'll just delete and block. If they're willing to engage in a dialogue, I'm absolutely willing to have a conversation all day long about it because people are allowed to have different opinions and that's fine. Um, but, you know, obviously 
There's the delete and block feature on social media for a reason. Um, but I remember there was one time it was particularly bad. I had gotten like just really cruelly attacked in a Facebook group this was years ago. And I don't know if you guys know Allison Pereira. Um, she's a friend of mine. She abundance practice building is her business. She helps therapists grow in private practice. And I was texting her and I was like, oh, Allison, like, how do I deal with this? And she goes, oh. She goes, send them after me. They'll get Teflon under their nails. Like she had just developed such a like, oh, whatever, get them out of here. Um, and I thought, okay, I need more of that. Like I need more of that self-protection. And it's, the internet can be a cruel place. I had a friend um, just this week, totally unrelated to any like therapy and coaching type, type stuff, but he had put up a post and a bunch of people attacked him on it. And I was texting him about it and just the emotional impact of that and of trying to, be a good person who takes in the feedback and who doesn't just, you know, say, oh, screw you to everybody, like, you know, coming after you, who actually does try to take it all in. It's very challenging and it's an emotional challenge. And with every time you go through it, it does get easier. And it does, and at a certain point, at least for me right now, if somebody's really coming from that place of like, oh, this is terrible and no therapist should ever make any money and everybody should be happy eating ramen forever. But if you actually cared about your clients, you know, that's what you would do. I'm, I look at it and I'm like, that person is at such a different place in their worldview than I'm at right now. And I used to feel that way. So I understand where they are. And maybe someday they'll feel this way and they'll look back and go, oh, that's where I was then, just like I'm able to do now. But I don't try to sort of argue people into a different worldview. It's just not worth it to me. I don't have that kind of time and energy. You let it go spend. and you lean on your support. It sounds like that's it's the thing. people that you go to and leave the rest behind. Yeah. But it sounds, yeah. sounds like that too, being able to go where you're valued, go to places that reflect your creativity, your desire to, again, maybe have upward mobility or expand yourself, stay away from the, or just leave those groups that are like the crabs in the bucket, looking to pull yeah. each other down and keep each other down. I think it's great. Yeah. And like you said, if people are cruel to realize that wonderful reframe of, Hey, you know, wow, I must be really making a difference for someone to spend their yeah. time attacking <laughs> but having so to, yeah. that somebody might be that that might be where they're at in their journey. And, yep. and maybe, maybe they'll, of all past it, or, or maybe they won't, what really inspires you? What do you find is your major why? And again, I think you have spoken to that in different ways, but distilling that down for you, what really drives you in a positive way to keep doing what you're doing? Well, uh, there's, so I have too many answers going through my head at once. So the first thing that comes to my mind is my kids and my family. And those are, of course, the, the given, I'm sure. But that's kind of everyone's first why. But really being able to provide them a good life. Um, travel is important to us. We want to be able to take them on traveling experiences and show them the world and give them everything they need as people with some extra needs be able to, you know, it was very, very hard. Their first several years of diagnosis, we were very broke trying to pay for all of their services. And it's a constant struggle where you're like, well, if we pay for speech, we can't do PT and OT. One of them has to go, you know, and you're in that constant struggle like that. And so being able to do all of those things and everything they need without uh, having to cut and choose between the two is hugely important. Um, so that's a big one for me. And I think over time, it has developed more and more to, I wonder where I can have impact that I'm not even anticipating yet. I think if there's anything I've learned about myself over time, it's that as scared as I am to do the things I do, I'm brave enough that I do them. And I think because of that, I've had life experiences and I've had lessons that I'm like, I can bring these back to the people, <laughs> you know, help the people with them. We have actually, by the time this podcast comes out, it should be live. Um, just recently, I had started this brand new thing with our clients and I was sort of doing it as an experiment. I wanted to stay more connected to our clients after they graduated. And so I started sending out, they were like my captive audience, which is so funny. I was like, I'm sending these to you. You have no choice. Um, but I started sending out a text each morning just with a little like one to two minute audio. And it would just be something that I was thinking about that day, maybe a reframe on something going on in the world, maybe something about motivation or mindset or doing it scared or 
psychology or therapy, like uh, things like this in general, resilience, those types of things. And I just started sending out these little daily voice notes. And the response was amazing and wonderful. And the clients loved them and they felt really connected and they were using them as journaling prompts or they were using them as like their little, you know, coffee connection with Katie moment during the day, or they were like, they would bring them to their own therapy clients and coaching clients too sometimes. And so with that, um, I'm actually opening that up as a, well, when we're recording this, we're opening it up for the first time tomorrow, praying that all of our tech flows smoothly, but we're opening it up to anybody who wants to join and wants to just get delivered to their text This little one to two minute daily, it might be a story with a little lesson in it, might be something like that, but just that little daily like aha moment that maybe sometimes will be just exactly what you needed to hear that day. And so we're opening those up for everybody. I'm calling it the Growing Edge Microcast because it's kind of like a little micro podcast. Um, And I'm excited about that because for the first time, I feel like, oh, maybe I can offer something beyond the marketing coaching and the therapist to coach training, but something kind of for everybody, which is like lessons learned from the front, you know, from somebody out here doing it and trying the scary stuff and trying to bring back the lessons learned from all of it to hopefully inspire people who are trying to follow along that same path. So, and I'll just do my shameless plug. If anybody's listening to this, by the time this opens up, it's totally free. It's just a little daily podcast. You can unsubscribe if you hate them. (laughs) totally fine. <laughs> I said in the unsubscribe thing, I'm like, we'll still love you. We'll still think you have cool hair, even if you unsubscribe. <laughs> but you just go- <laughs> People can go to heykatyreed.com and opt in there, or just go to my Instagram, which is heykatyreed, K-A-T-I-E-R-E-A-D, heykatyreed on Instagram, and you can opt in there as well. And uh, it, I just think that to me has become more and more of my why. And I'm hoping that eventually maybe I can turn those into a book and I can start bringing some of those uh, things just into a more uh, an easy to digest format for anyone who it might be helpful for. Great. Sounds incredible. That sounds really cool. I think I'm going to. Yeah. To please, please try. sign up, please, by all means, because it's opening up tomorrow. And I'm like, please let there be more than like four people who sign up. So yes, if well, you maybe you'll have at least two. It. Yeah, right right here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> well, it's been so great talking with you. And before we before we wrap up, you've shared your website. Are there any other places that that any of these followers or listeners could follow you or get in touch with you? So right now, there's, I have two different Instagram sites. So if you are interested in the Clinic Coach Academy and learning more, you're going to go to Instagram, just Clinic Coach Academy on Instagram. Hey, Katie Reed on Instagram is also going to be there. That's going to be the home of the Growing Edge microcast going forward. But Clinic Coach Academy is our home for all the education that I do for therapists about how to become coaches is going to be over there on the Clinic Coach Academy. And it, my main website is not Hey Katie Reed. My main website is just katiereed.com. I have freebies there. You can do katiereed.com backslash freebies. I give you a million guides for free on how to start right now. If you're a therapist thinking about outgrowing your office, it's an easy, low impact way to start. The application is also there on one of the pages for the Six Figure Flagship Program. We have multiple price points. We have multiple uh, levels of engagement that people can join at. So feel free, go check it out over there. But there's a ton of free stuff everywhere. But I would say right now, probably the most active place to follow me currently would be Instagram. We're trying to double down on our Instagram efforts. All right. And we'll put all of those links in the show notes as well, wherever we post the show. So, um, so if you're listening and you want those, just go to the show notes and then we'd like to leave on the note of just a kind of a personal, but more fun question you mentioned that you like to sing karaoke. What is your go-to karaoke <laughs> song? I don't have one, but I will tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I only sing in groups. It's hilarious. My husband and I, we, I love karaoke when it's like a whole group of people just shouting together because then my bad voice can just be drowned out <laughs> as background noise. And I love that. But, oh my gosh, my husband and I went to a party not long ago and the guy whose birthday it was is like a lead singer in a band. And so they were like, it's a karaoke party. And on the way there, I was like, babe, I was like, these are like sing, like, what if it's like a, you have to stand up and 
It literally was. We get there. It's like, sign up for what song you're going to perform. I was so <laughs> they're like, they're all like musicians and singers. So they're all like singing. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so do not invite me to a karaoke party. If I have to sign up and stand up there alone, please, I will go to all the karaoke songs only. <laughs> together. It, exactly. was, it was such a pleasure to get to speak with you Thank and you learn too. more about you. Thank you for working to try to expand the profession and give people hope and opportunity if they're feeling stagnant or they're just wanting to take themselves to the next level. I'm sure we would agree. We'd love to have you back and talk more specifically yeah. about other topics in the future. So if you're interested, Anytime. definitely stay in touch. Anytime. I would love that. Thank you guys so much. Thank so, you. We'll see you later, Katie. We'll see ya. Bye guys.